and two. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to be talking chips today. Potato Salt, chips, vinegar, tortillas. barbecue, <laughs> sour cream and onion. I was just, I was, I think, was it yesterday, day before yesterday, I was talking about those all dressed chips? Yeah, right. Waffles. It was the other day you were talking about those. Canadian and as I was saying, like, they kind of stink. They don't, some they don't weird taste weird flavors for potato chips they have, like at Trader Joe's now and stuff. No. Well, the, Sriracha and. Oh, that's not weird. Pickle flavored and. Yeah. Pickles well, I mean, it can, I mean, yes. the whole the whole yeah. all dressed one is like it's Canadian because they get like ketchup flavored, they have pickle flavored mm-hmm. chips. But what's interesting is like for all this time, everyone's telling me how great they are, and in one sense, it's true because I can't stop eating them once I start eating them. But they don't really t- they taste okay, but they're not like an amazing taste. And they they my my wife hates the smell of them. It just smells like feet. So, this is just because there's vinegar in it. And so, Do your feet smell like potato chips? Smell like. Uh. I used to think Lay's used to stink, like a bag of Lay's. Yeah. Just not. You open it, it stinks. To me, it physically stinks. So, which I always, I my go to's are the Hawaiian chips, the, the oh, sweet yeah, Maui the onion, kettle. and the barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, those are good. So, yeah, those and maybe are the good. fake onion rings, the Funyuns. <laughs> Funyuns. Oh, those are good. You can't have fun without Funyuns. No, and it's like I onion eat, rings. I don't eat any kind of chips or anything like that on a regular basis. I don't like buy them for the house. It's just a, a preventative measure on my own part. <laughs> yeah, I don't eat. I don't. I try not to eat them. That's why I don't buy them because I, if they're around, I'll eat them. Snack yeah, them. same. Yeah, exactly. And it's not because I want to. It's just because it's quick and easy to chew. Hmm. You just want something salty in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My sort of snack food of choice recently has been sort of unsalted mixed nuts because you don't need very many. Uh uh, You you nibble on them one at a time, and after you have a handful, you say, oh, that was enough. I'm done. Yeah, we keep a little little glass bowl of uh, mixed nuts uh, for snacks. It's Mm -hmm. good. It does. It takes the edge off. Um, Especially if it's uh, like the trail mix where you just throw in some raisins. No, nothing else. Just nuts. <laughs> nuts. And, I like. I like. <laughs> I like some chewy bits as well. So <laughs> there there I like the raisins to perdition. Yeah, we but can't... I don't like trail mix with M and M's or Reese's in them. Yeah, we don't do trail mix. We just do the mixed nuts. Uh, but my wife prefers almonds over all the other kinds of nuts. So what I'll do is I'll buy a bag of almonds and a bag of mixed nuts. Mix those two bags together so that there's more almonds per. Uh-huh. I used to buy those uh, barbecue, or is it the honey roasted or barbecue? Oh, the blue diamond ones. Uh-huh. Yeah, we don't we don't do the flavored ones. Because you keep eating them, and then you get sick. Yeah, <laughs> they're saltier too. Ah, delicious salt. <laughs> <laughs> Bad weave in our chat room says I like the chili tochi's Fritos. <laughs> Or but spells it Fitos. Fitos. Mm. What's great are the amazing flavored things that you get out of Japanese uh, stores and stuff. Oh, oh yeah, I remember getting the. Um, the when I used to hit Japan Town, and I didn't see any here, but they do have the same supermarket or grocery store where they carry all the different flavors of Kit Kats. Right. A friend of mine named Dale uh, went on a, a Kit Kat tour of Japan. <laughs> uh, and just bought Kit Kat, different flavored Kit Kats all over the place. He collects them, so he he gave me a bag of a bunch of different flavors, like wine wow. flavor and tea, green tea flavor and a lemon tea flavor and a hazelnut. The green tea flavor ones are good, actually. Yeah, yeah. Melon, the cantaloupe one was really good too. Because oh. it has a good part of the cantaloupe, just not the weird aftertaste. <laughs> Yeah, like that's weird because that's the thing. Like I like honeydew initially, like once it, once I taste it, but like it's just like the 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 rest of it's gonna. Like, yeah. There was a coffee flavored Kit Kat, which I was kind of disappointed wow. in because I would think would, that would be really good. Coffee and chocolate. A it coffee. was just too. It was kind of light. It was too light. Uh, they put too much milk in the coffee. I guess. Yes, cafe au lait instead of that. <laughs> yeah, coffee. yeah. Hoping it's not too early for DTNS to cover today's big deal. Okay. Yeah, it's in there. You guys ready? Anytime. Yes. Let's roll then.
Oh, wait, I'll need control. You have it. You good? Yes. All right, here we go. The Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by listeners just like me and you, not outside organizations. To find out how you can contribute, visit dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 14th, 2017. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, very happy to have Lloyd Case back on the show, analyst at the Lindley Group, and of course, uh, the person behind his website, uncertainty.com. Lloyd, how's it going? Good to have you back. It's going great. Having a good time. Glad to be here. Yeah, we've uh, we've been wanting to get you on to talk specifically about AMD's Ryzen chips. I like what you're right. doing on your blog, uh, where you're you're just living with the chips in the, in right. the uh, in the computer that you've got with them. That's it's really fun to read. Yeah, and I'm going to be keeping that up. I probably have five or six more parts, and then I'm also in the process of building like a budget rig that people can model off here and stuff like that. Well, we're going to talk about that and a few more things in a little bit, but let's start with a few tech things you should know. Facebook can now detect fake accounts better by looking for patterns like repeated posts or spikes in messaging activity without having to look at user content. Uh, the Facebook employee named Shake says the company has ended 30,000 fake accounts in France. I I don't really have too much usage of Facebook, Lloyd. I don't know about you, so I don't ha I don't run into these spam accounts too often, but I know they are a big problem. I have some. I mean, occasionally, the typical thing is you'll get a, a, a friend request from somebody who looks like a very pretty girl and has, like, no posts. You think, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, should be clamping down on that. And that's also kind of a knock-on effect of stopping uh, hoax news, false news, fake news, whatever you want to call it, uh, from being distributed. Because a lot of times these bot accounts will be passing along those kinds of links. Right. Nintendo announced it sold 906,000 Switch consoles in March and 925,000 copies of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for the Switch. That doesn't include the 400-some thousand copies they sold for the Wii U. So they sold more copies of Legend of Zelda for the Switch than they sold Switch consoles. That makes it the fastest-selling Nintendo console launch title and the fastest-selling Zelda game ever. Lloyd, I, I, we were speculating before the show, this must be some people buying them before they could get a hold of the console, maybe some people buying collector's editions. It could very well be. I mean, I know people who will buy a collector's edition of something and then buy the thing itself to watch it or play it or whatever. Yeah, so. put one away and then one for use. Right. The Zelda the Zelda crowd seems like that is the kind of crowd who would do that in some large numbers. But I think a lot of it is people who are like, well, I can get the game. I've got a pre-order in. I've got an order in for the Switch whenever it arrives. I just haven't got one yet. Right. A uh, set of hacking tools supposedly used by the NSA have been leaked online containing several zero-day exploits targeting multiple products, including Lotus Notes, Lotus Domino, 2S, SMB, Windows XP, Windows 8, 2S, IIS, uh, Windows Server 2003, Windows Server 2012. These are older versions of Windows, uh, but Microsoft told Fortune it is reviewing the report and will take the necessary actions. A lot of times... I think these sorts of leaks can be overhyped, Lloyd, because it may be some kind of zero-day exploit that can be qu fixed quickly and not do too much damage if people are taking normal security processes. Right. But we've got a we've got a couple dozen zero-day exploits coming at once. That's quite a bit. Yeah, and people really need to make sure they update their uh, operating systems as soon as they can. Yeah, sure. uh, right. and keep keep an eye out for new patches. Although it does sound like if you're up to Windows 10, you shouldn't have to worry about these particular batch anyway. Right. Uh, here are some more top stories. California DMV added Apple's name to the list of companies that have received permits to test autonomous vehicles in the state. The permit covers three 2015 Lexus RX 540HSs, uh, 540Hs, I'm sorry, and uh, six drivers. If you recall, Apple wrote a letter in December to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in response to proposed guidelines for autonomous cars. In particular, that letter argued that companies should not have to seek permission to test autonomous vehicles that will never be used by the general public. So don't get too excited about Apple building a car. But the conventional wisdom, Lloyd, is that Apple is definitely coming up with software for autonomous cars. Right. I, a lot of people are. And I feel like they're trying to test the right mix of hardware and software and deep learning, they at least want to build their deep learning network so that they can, you know, license those. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, especially with a deep learning network, you need to have it go out and encounter things to right. learn from them. Uh, and if and what, what I would take this to mean is that Apple feels like it's got its software up to the point that it needs to do more extensive testing than it can do out in its backyard. And right. for that, on California Highway, you, you need to register. 
I find that phrase will never be used by the general public to be a little disingenuous though, because it's going to be encountered by the general public, right? Sure. I mean, the software maybe driving a different car would be, right? So, well, or, or if they're testing it on public streets, who knows what could happen? Yeah, Google yeah. Encounters, right? So, I, I and that's why Apple is listing with the California DMV, I guess, is to make sure that they have that approval there. I, I, I do think that uh, this is probably a positive sign. I know that Apple probably still has a long way to go, but by all accounts, they have close to a thousand employees working on this. So it's, there's no doubt they're serious. The FCC's latest Spectrum auction is concluded. T-Mobile will pay $7.99 billion for 1,525 licenses in the U.S. that will allow it to offer mobile service in the 31 megahertz spectrum nationwide, quadrupling the carrier's low band holdings. Low band spectrum is pretty good for long distance transmission, goes through obstacles very well, uh, makes it good for rural, makes it good for congested building areas. T-Mobile will begin deploying service in the spectrum later this year. Uh, other people who got spectrum dish Acquired 486 licenses, adding to a stockpile that it has yet to use. I'm still curious what they're going to do with that. Comcast bought 73 licenses. They've got a service coming in June that is mostly running on the Verizon network, but also uses some of the Comcast Wi-Fi hotspots. So they could potentially supplement that with some of these new wireless licenses. U.S. Cellular bought 188 licenses. AT&T 23. Verizon and Sprint didn't buy any. Uh, and part of the Spectrum option is white space that was between TV channels that has been freed up and 14 megahertz of spectrum is now available for unlicensed use. Uh, and that can be used again for things like rural broadband where you don't have to worry about too many other people using the same spectrum. Uh, Internet of Things could use that. You know, it's un unlicensed is, is things like Wi-Fi. Any, any thoughts strike you out of this auction this time, Lloyd? Uh, the thing that occurs to me is that Dish Network owning a lot of licenses makes them an interesting acquisition target. Yeah, it's a it's a valuable so, stockpile to have for somebody. Right. More so than the TV part, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Sling TV seems to be doing okay. That their their online service, but it just doesn't have the scale to save Dish from anything else from from the main business declining. Right. And so, yeah, they need some diversification. Who do you think? Who do you, if you had to guess? Who do you think would buy Dish? That's I, you know, I can't even begin to say because you'd think the obvious candidates would be people like Comcast, but then there's the whole antitrust issue. So I don't know. We'll have to see that. Watch that one. Well, for, I, that they're going to eventually use those licenses to ship out, you know, to wirelessly deliver content themselves. So who knows? yeah, well, that's one of the things that Verizon wants to do uh, is use its network to deliver its own television service. They've got. Go 90, but they, they're also developing a, a more robust system. I could see Verizon maybe wanting to acquire Dish partly to right. get that spectrum, partly to get that infrastructure that Sling TV has been working on and fold it into their own efforts. Right. Google Brain has used data collected from 70,000 doodles made by humans in that quick draw image recognition game they ran a while back that had teach, uh, that taught rather an AI how to draw on its own. Uh, the AI is called Sketch RNN. Uh, it learned to draw objects without copying a starting sketch. So it can just start doodling a dog or, or a table. AI programs like SketchRN could be used as creative aids for designers, architects, and artists. This Verge article that I read speculated that if you are working on something and you get stuck, the AI could give you an assist and say, well, what if you, what if you took your drawing this direction? Right. It's also, I think, could be an interesting tool for people who want to be artists but just aren't good at it, and they can mm -hmm. get a startup on... on implementing their creative ideas yeah i i i definitely fall into that category <laughs> i mean i i was playing with that uh that drawing website that google unleashed earlier this week where you can sketch something and it will give you a clip art that's better that's made by a professional drawing this is kind of halfway in between isn't it NHK reports Apple is considering teaming up with Foxconn to bid for Toshiba's semiconductor business. Report says Apple is considering a stake of about 20%, while T Toshiba might even retain a stake. Uh, Apple reportedly would like Foxconn to have about 30%, so it doesn't sound like anybody would have a 50% majority if this were the the plan that ends up being approved. Meanwhile, right. Nikkei Business Daily reported Foxconn has asked SoftBank to join it in a bid. But I don't know how close you've been following this, Lloyd, but Japan would like whoever buys Toshiba's semiconductor business to stay in Japan. So if Apple had a stake and Toshiba kept a stake, I don't know if that would satisfy their concerns. Yeah, and the interesting part of that is that 
what part of Toshiba Semiconductor are we talking about? I mean, are they going to keep it together? Because the massive, the biggest chunk of it is the memory piece, right? Yeah, and that that's the that's the part that they're talking about for the most part. Yeah, and all the people who make the car semiconductors and stuff like that are a pretty small chunk of change. Yeah, it's mostly about the flash memory, the NAND uh, stuff, and they're selling it because they need to pay for the fact that Westinghouse went bankrupt. Uh, right. which which is they owned over here in the United States, and that's a result of nuclear power. So it's a whole chain of events. And Japan is very protective of keeping Japanese businesses Japanese owned. So right. there's a lot of lot of balancing act, big balancing act going on here. Uh, d- do you think it ends up hurting or helping us as consumers in the long run? Well, since this is mostly the flash memory piece of it, I think. Uh, if whoever buys them invests in foundry space and, and expands capacity, that's a good thing for consumers because right now flash memory capacity is really tight. And so you see things like prices of SSD start to go up. Uh, so long term, if somebody invests in it properly, it could be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, as part of a policy change originally announced back in January 2016, Microsoft began blocking updates to users of Intel, Cabby Lake, and AMD Ryzen processors from running Windows 7 or 8.1, you got to run Windows 10. Uh, That even includes security patches for Windows 7 and 8.1. Intel Skylake processors are also affected, although there's a whitelist of 16 manufacturers there uh, that will receive continued support. Microsoft changed the update policy due to what they say is difficulty in making new hardware features compatible with older operating systems. It does feel quite a bit like this is another one of those planks in Microsoft's plan to force people to move up to Windows 10. Do, Do you feel like they have a legitimate argument here? Uh, I think they have a more of a legitimate argument on the Ryzen side just because it's a, it really is a new architecture. I mean, Cabby Lake is really an evolution of going back to Broadwell and even before. So I am a little bit skeptical. There's a few new features, but I don't know. It seems a little odd to me. It doesn't feel like it will affect that many people. It, it mostly will affect people who build their own systems. And even those people, if if you're building a new system with Cabby Lake, wouldn't you be putting Windows 10 on it for the most part? So. But, you know, there are a lot of people that are still passionate about Windows 7 I, I read them almost daily. Yeah. And, and those people are going to be very angry about this. There's just no way around that. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines in uh, less than five minutes, subscribe to our sister show, Daily Tech Headlines. Dot com. Well, as we mentioned, uh, Lloyd has been playing around with Ryzen. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about where Ryzen sits. I know we've talked about it a bit on the show, but it's not exactly a direct competitor to almost anything. It, it kind of sits in between. Right. Yeah. So Ryzen 7 uh, has a lot of features that you see on the really super high end which process many cores, lots of threads. Uh, on the other hand, where they don't compete with Extreme Edition, Processors is they only have, they have limited memory bandwidth relative to uh, the extreme edition processors. We have two memory channels versus four, um, and so the, so they've priced it even so that it's sort of less than the extreme edition, but a little more than the, the consumer re- uh, versions of the Intel processors. I think it's a smart move because that way people can get you know amazing thread performance if they need that, and if they don't, if they don't need the memory bandwidth, which is sort of a niche uh, kind of thing anyway, then they're they're good to go. Uh, I've been pretty impressed with overall with both the, and the power usage is way down for AMD. It's great to see AMD now should be efficient processors as well. Uh, so yeah, Ryzen five. Ryzen five is more of a direct competitor with Intel mainstream processors. Uh, now, they, one of the things that I, I've seen a few people complain about, or, or maybe not complain, but express concern about, is if I'm a gamer, I'm a video gamer. <laughs> Does, is Ryzen even an option for me? Because maybe I would like to help the underdog out, but I don't want to do it at the expense of my performance. Right. So here's been my experience. First, a couple of notes first. Uh, one thing that uh, people have noticed is that if you rebuild the game and recompile it for to take Ryzen into account, your performance in that game goes up. So there's some obviously some tuning that will need to be done. Uh, also, a lot of the console game developers are developing for AMD now, in a sense, since both of the major consoles use AMD cores, even though they're not Ryzen cores. So I think a little bit. Of, I think we'll see that start to shake out over time. Uh, but the other thing that's really salient is if you are running a relatively decent graphics card on a high-resolution monitor, it almost doesn't matter. People have done a lot of benchmarks and find out that it's basically flat compared to Intel if you're running a high-res with a good graphics card. Well, and that brings up the other side of this. Uh, AMD doesn't have integrated graphics in Ryzen yet. Do you, is that something sure. they need to pay attention to? I think so, and, and they will. Uh, that's on the roadmap towards the end of the year. 
they'll they'll be adding their um, uh, GCN cores, just like the uh, existing APUs, but they'll be on our, using Ryzen CPU cores instead of uh, uh, the older ones. Uh, I should note that we've been doing some experiential testing here, uh, just having people play games on a Ryzen system with a GTX 1080, so beefy graphics card on a 1440p monitor. Nobody's had any problems. We haven't had crashes. Frame rate's been good. Experience has been good. So I think that, that validates that. So if you're a gamer, you could get a Ryzen, get a 1080. I mean, if you yeah. could if you could plunk down for it, uh, well, spend less on a Ryzen and get yourself a big graphics card, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If if you're somebody who's wanting a cheaper machine, uh, and and maybe this is more about Ryzen five than mm -hmm. it is about Ryzen seven, uh, what advantage do you get out of going with a machine that has AMD in it? Uh, again, they're they're pricing the Ryzen five processors pretty aggressively. The, and ha offering a few more features. For example, the Ryzen 5 1600X has six cores, whereas no Intel mainstream processor does, and supports uh, six, um, 12 threads. So now you have this sort of a thread monster uh, at a very mainstream price that then you can run other things on. Because I think most people, even most gamers, don't just play games, right? They do a lot of other things. Um, PC Perspective did some interesting tests where they uh, uh, AMD issued a new power profile because one of the things Windows was doing was it was putting all the cores to sleep without needing to do that. And that, and that wake up time affected a lot of performance in a few cases. And, and now the, the performance is much smoother on, on a variety of applications. Now, uh, one of the things I noted when, when AMD came out with Ryzen is this does get them back into the desktop game. It does, as, as you've said, make x86 interesting again. Right. How, how important is that? versus the fact that this doesn't really help AMD in mobile, which is where, every, and, and and when I say mobile here, I'm talking about tablet and phone. It helps right. them in mobile with laptop, right? Uh, what, how, how does that work for AMD? Is that okay, or do or they still need to be concerned with, with phones and tablets? I don't, tablets, maybe the higher-end tablet kind of SKUs, um, the two-in-one kind of products like uh, uh, Surface, the Microsoft Surface series. I don't think it matters as much with sort of the iPad class tablets. Uh, and if you look at what Intel did, they spent billions of dollars trying to get into the mobile business and eventually shut it down. So I think that uh, I don't think that the phone part is going to be that important to AMD. But I worry that, well, I don't worry because I'm not an AMD stockholder, but if I were AMD, I would worry that, you know, what Intel's doing is trying to leapfrog over into Internet of Things and, and AI and vision sensing and machine uh, vision. And that, that gives them a future. If right. AMD is, is making very compelling x86 chips, which they are, what do they do down the road? Or do they, do they risk hitting a cul-de-sac there? Right. Well, what AMD does have that Intel doesn't have is it has a pretty strong graphics business, right? So one of the things they've done is that in, in that business, they compete more with NVIDIA, but they have been starting to deliver um, GPU compute units, uh, GPU compute cards that are strictly for server compute. And uh, those are starting to show up. You find those in server clusters now uh, doing the sort of deep learning kind of uh, software and, and generation that uh, has mostly been the purview of NVIDIA. And, and you know, uh, for, for the moment anyway, o OEMs are happy because now they can diversify their lineup. Right. They've got something new to sell. That's always good. I mean, Cabby Lake was kind of a yawner for a lot of these companies that didn't really sort of boost their sales really at all. But uh, Rise and Might, we'll set the see. Uh, the the uh, ecosystem of Ryzen is interesting, too, because in the past, when you would buy AMD, you would sort of basically be stuck with a bunch of budget products. But now there's a lot of sort of really high-end, gamer-oriented, you know, motherboards, a lot of bling and stuff like that starting to show up. Kind of neat. Uh, and, and I know you've been playing around with it, uh, but but what are some of the performance discoveries uh, that you've found in, in, in tweaking around with Ryzen? Uh, the more I play around with it, and, and as, as the uh, state of the art uh, progresses, like the new power profiles and things like that, I found it to be a better and smoother experience. My early experience right out of the box with the system was a little rough in the sense of uh, things like stuttering in games and things like that. But as new drivers have come out, new BIOSes have come out, and I've found that the experience has gotten a lot smoother. So I think uh, we are still at early days on this. What are, what are the, the bottom line questions for people I know, uh, and, and this goes from the, the person who's ready to build their own PC and sees this as a great option, all the way down to the person who has barely any idea what the chipset means to them and just wants to know, if it's got an AMD Ryzen chip, is that something that I care about? Who, who is this for? Who should be looking for these in the devices? 
at this point in time, if you're talking about like the average home office user who never plays a game and mainly does maybe super light photo editing at best, I think that uh, they're still better off with Intel solution because Intel offers integrated graphics and you'll see those classes of systems uh, for those people. But I think as you move up the chain, if you're doing any kind of photo editing or video editing, Rising gets very attractive because all those threads become very useful. Uh, uh, you start to hit up at the very high end if you're doing 4K or higher video in terms of memory bandwidth. But up until that point, you know, Ryzen's a pretty monster uh, processor. Yeah, it's, it sounds like you get a lot of performance for for uh, for your dollar spent. Right, yeah. Yeah. And I think AMD's been a little conservative on power, so I have to see how that goes. I've been impressed with how cool they run. All right. Uh, before we move along, though, I want to point out the uh, uh, the Ryzen diary that you're doing at uncertainty.com. You've got two yep. parts up so far. Right. Uh, tell, tell people a little bit of, about what you're doing here and what they can find if they follow along. Right. So uh, AMD worked with CyberPower to send me a system that was basically an out-of-box Ryzen system. Uh, I didn't particularly like the entire configuration, so I've been fooling around with it, taking some things out, adding some things in, using it on a daily basis for some things like gaming and stuff like that. And just sort of sharing that experience rather than running a bunch of benchmarks and saying, here's what the performance is. Because I think in the end, uh, most people are going to use the system for a variety of things, and uh, one set of benchmarks may not help them at all. Uh, and I also ran into some glitches that turned out to be not AMD-related. I want to make sure I pointed out that that wasn't an AMD problem and, and share how I fixed those. And talk about troubleshooting. So it's a whole sort of package on how, how my experience with the system. Yeah, how unlucky that you had a bad flash drive just, just <laughs> randomly. Right. SSDs are so reliable these days, right? <laughs> so having one go bad on me was kind of a shock. Uh, but I love this idea of road, you're basically road testing. You're saying, right. look, you can you can read you can read the benchmarks till your eyes bleed all over the internet. You know, let, right. let's give you an idea of what this will be like in practice. So this is pretty right. cool. And so the end goal of this, by the way, is to sort of rebuild this into uh, what I call a production system and, and make it my daily system for a while and see how that goes. Very cool. Very cool. Well, speaking of cool, one of the things you did was change the cooling system already. Right. Right? That's right. Uh, go check it out, folks. Uncertainty.com. Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. A couple of emails before we're out of here today. Uh, Renard uh, just watched the build your own phone story on strangeparts.com. Did you catch this, Lloyd? The guy that. I didn't. That sounds amazing. No, oh, he, I, I read about it. I, I read about it. I need to go read the site, though. But, uh, yeah, yeah, he's got a great video of him going through the market and shopping for parts and, and everything. Right. Uh, Renard says the scary part is the end with the box and other parts. It shows you how you could buy an iPhone on eBay or other sites and actually not be getting an iPhone that was made by Apple. I know counterfeiting is big in China. I think it's overestimated how big it is, but it does happen. Right. Uh, this shows how it's done. Just wow, I've had similar headphones and it was obvious the quality wasn't copied. Or, I'm sorry, smaller headphones, but it was obviously the quality wasn't copied. But this story shows how on some products you may never know. I guess if it works, you may not care if the price is right. I just know if I spend the bigger money, I want my device to have come from the brand name company. And you want the warranty and all of that, too, probably. Right. Um, I think this is harder to do than than you might think. And I, and I think the video at, at strangeparts.com sort of shows that. Yeah, it's not quite like counterfeit luxury watches, right? It's a little more involved than that. Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing that struck me about this uh, uh, is that he's basically doing the same thing you do when you build your own PC. Right. It's just that nobody it can do that because it's a lot harder. It's a, it's a lot more intricate, I guess. Right. There are places here in Silicon Valley where you can rummage around and find these kinds of parts. So I, I assume that other people are doing this, too. Yeah, it's it's just that you know in in, in China they've got this market that that is vast, right? right? Um, I can, what's right. what's the warehouse down there in San Jose where you could you can buy like old Palm Pilots and they just have buckets oh, yeah. full of chips? And, Are they still there? I, I know what you're talking about. I used to go there a long time ago, but I haven't been there in a while. Yeah, it's uh, it, and it's, it's fun. Stuff. Weird stuff is yeah, weird stuff is one of them. There's actually a couple of them, but yeah, yeah. Weird stuff is another one. imagine like a hundred of those kinds of places all gathered together in one. That's right. that's what it seems like he's going to here. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, Renard is right. If you can get the parts and put it together, you can make something that looks like the original thing. And then it becomes a matter of semantics. If it's actually got all the parts, is it right. any different? Right. Yeah. Uh, Andy Chase wrote in and said, hey, Tom and crew, 
often hear on your show a lot of praise for Domino's Pizza and their use of technology. We have talked about uh, their use of bots and online ordering. He says, as a frequent Domino's customer, I have to disagree. The pizza tracker only seems to work for on-time pizza. I've often had the tracker tell me the pizza arrived an hour before it actually arrived. I'm not sure if it's a dumb timer or the staff is saying the pizza is done so they don't get in trouble, but this piece of Domino's technology needs some real-world improvement. Uh, of course, your, your mileage may vary, but that is odd that 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 it only works if the pizza actually arrives on time it's as if, it's as if maybe in this case it's being the, the people i guess what i'm saying is this kind of thing can only work so so well as the people putting in the data so if right. the delivery driver just is auto has written a script i guess <laughs> i don't know i don't know what would explain right. that but it's yeah, it's, it relies on the people saying, you know, I mean, there's not we haven't got to the point where a bot can see independently that the pizza has been delivered. But we'll get right, there's this, there was this funny um, video that NVIDIA sent out. I don't know if you saw this about one of their uh, ro uh, NVIDIA powered robots delivering food in San Francisco. That was pretty oh, funny. uh huh. Yeah. Uh, is this the uh, is this the Star Lab people or is it different? I don't know who it is. It was just I just came across my email. I just took a quick look at it and I said, oh, OK. Yeah, had I mean, built an oven. Imagine well, and this this brings up an interesting thought. Imagine if you had like one of those uh, ring doorbells or a Nest Cam or something uh, hooked into a system where you feed back to Domino's or whoever uh, it, some some imagery that would be recognized to verify. So if right. Domino's system said it was delivered and your your Nest Cam didn't see it delivered, then right. You know, the, it it would it would cause at least the issue to be raised. Yeah, I mean, UPS is doing that now, right? I get pings now and then saying your package has been delivered. It's oh, okay, good. I can go to my front porch and, and pick it up. Yeah, and it's, it's nice. It would be nice to have your own device be able to verify that. Say, uh, I don't know, the post office saying it's delivered, but I don't see it. Right. Uh, anyway, that's that's really, thank you, Andy, for uh, writing in, and thank you, Lloyd, for joining us. It was, it's always fun to talk to you because uh, you're you're so knowledgeable and you're really into this stuff, and I can tell you enjoy it. So thanks for sharing your insights with us. My pleasure. Take care, guys. If uh, folks want to find more of what you're doing, where should they go? Uh, two places. Uncertainty.com is my personal blog where I'm doing a lot of the rise and stuff and other things. Uh, I just wrote about my experience, for example, with a new uh, Sigma art lens for my DSLR, uh, which is fun to do. Uh, but also my professional life, I'm at, you can find my stuff at lindley.com. You'll find a few of them for free. A lot of them behind a paywall, but that's where I hang my hat professionally. L-I-N-L-E-Y.com. And of course, his own blog, yep. uncertainty.com. Right. Thanks to everybody who gives a little value back to this show. That's the model we work on. If you get some value out of the show, we just ask you to give a little value back. Uh, that includes Dave Vaughn, Telmo Guerrero, Daryl Harris, and many, many more. Thanks to every single one of you who makes the show possible. We could not do it without you at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back on Monday with Veronica's Bot Cave? We'll find out. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> ah, that was great, Lloyd. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. It was fun to hang out with you guys. Yeah, same here. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if you remember from last time, but we always just hang out live uh, while we name the show and edit and stuff. If you need to go, sure. go whatever you need to go. You can hang out, whatever you want to do. Good for a little while. Cool. Hey, I had a question for you. So does this kind of uh, reinforce the uh, the x86 um, architecture? I mean, with with the with the or or is it just? I mean, one of the things that. Um, I want to say AMD. I want to. What's the uh, what's the chip designer that they don't make? They just design ARM. ARM. Yeah. So ARM is like is super ubiquitous in tablets and and um, mobile. Right. So I'm wondering. Will, I mean, is this will this end up helping to shore up the x86 market, or is that like one of those things where it? I mean, it's it's destined for a sunset at some no, point. I think I can't predict. I mean, someday everything will sunset. But I mean, at this point in time, I think x86 has its strength, of course, in the PC market that we're all familiar with, but also huge in the server infrastructure, right? Most servers run on Intel. 
and some servers run on AMD, and very, very few today run on uh, ARM processors, and I don't know that you'll see that happen very quickly. Uh, it'll change very quickly, even though Microsoft has ported Windows Server to ARM and things like that. Uh, so we'll have to see how that goes, but I think at this point, uh, Intel's making most of its money on x86, and a lot of that's in the server business. So we sometimes forget about the, all the cloud stuff, and that's where a lot of that's going. Um, all right, top title that we have is Mojo Ryzen. <laughs> Uh, followed up is AMD Ryzen to the top. Uh, if you don't know what the uh, website is, uh, Lloyd, it's uh, showbot, S-H-O-W-B-O-T dot. Okay. Um, followed up with uh, a, a Nintendo is allowed to switch its mind. <laughs> uh, Nintendo switches its mind. Win, lose, or Google AI draw. Good artist borrow. Google's, Google's artist steal. <laughs> AMD has Ryzen. Micropocalypse. Oh, yeah, Apple that's the Microsoft. Apple cars from the makers of Apple Maps. <laughs> that's kind of funny. <laughs> Piction ARI. Spring has sprung. AMB has, I think that meant AMD has risen. Rise. Uh, yeah, typo. Yeah, I, think that's I like hard. Mojo Ryzen. I think that's Mojo. what I, yeah. yeah. That's pretty Go good. That. Mojo Ryzen. Lloyd, you have a preference? I'm trying to find out my uh, co-blogger, or David Bryant, had a funny one. Oh, well, Rise and Shine. Ah, uh, that's good. I like that that's one not mine. I, I gave it to Dave. You should have David on your show sometime, by the way. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. He's a fellow at Mozilla, and he's you know done a lot of their uh, sort of hardware-oriented stuff, and he's got a lot of the years of experience in the industry, including Sun and Bell Labs, things like oh, that'd that. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah no, we'd love to. Do, if he'd, do, if he'd be up for it, that'd be gone. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Have, do you have yeah. his contact info that you could? I will. Email? I will email that to you. Cool. Yeah. Um, now I'm really excited. It's, it's been a while since I've been excited about anything AMD outside of their video cards. Right. Um, so this is this is pretty cool. I'm I'm really I'm really excited to see what they do with a with an integrated on die GPU AP right. whatever mm -hmm. you know. Well, right. you can just see what they've done with like PlayStation 4 Pro and with, with the upcoming Scorpio. I mean, those are seriously, seriously badass graphics on an integrated processor, right? So I think uh, if they do that for the PC, that could be they could put a hurt on mid-range graphics cards. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, pretty much all the low-end stuff is pretty much eaten away by uh, Intel's integrated graphics. Right. So I mean, it'd be great. I would just want one less thing I got to buy. Right. Uh, and it could it could could make for a decent laptop. I mean, if they can get the uh, the temperatures, mm -hmm. the 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 power usage down right. to acceptable levels, mm -hmm. be cool. Yeah, when I, I sometimes I see some grumbling about Windows not playing well with AMD, and 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 there definitely is some there's some factual basis with the idea that Intel does seem to get a little preferential treatment, but right. I don't think it's because Microsoft doesn't like AMD or anything. I mean, they're working with them just fine on the Xbox. It, right. Uh, it's it's, it's probably it's more about market share, game. right? Well, Intel has a lot of people working in the labs aggressively pushing stuff towards Microsoft, you know, because uh, if it runs really well on Intel, it'll also make Microsoft look good. Yeah. Uh, so I think that we'll see the similar thing happen with AMD. AMD is going to want to make their stuff look good, and Microsoft is not going to want to get the wrap of having running poorly on AMD. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, especially could, if this gets good uptake, which it looks like it might. I mean, right. if it does, does does this mean that Apple at some point could theoretically say, like, hey, AMD, they also make an x86 architecture, which requires a little to Apple know. seems to want to just design everything themselves, but yes. yeah, maybe. Yes. You all saw the news about imagination last yeah. week. Yeah. That's pretty well, nice. and then there was another one this week. Uh, it was a report, not a not a not verified, but um, it was the uh, power management chip. Right. The people I, I'm, I'm a little more skeptical about that one. But, yeah. Uh, but the imagination thing could be huge. Yeah, but I, I mean, is that is that something they could could scale into a desktop, laptop? Or is that... Uh, they could. They would have to, you know, write their own drivers and stuff. You could absolutely, for example, take uh, an Apple graphics core, some, some mythical Apple graphics core, integrate it into a MacBook rather than a tablet, right? Mm -hmm. and Mac, hmm. Mac Pro. Um, I, I I saw that they apologized. Yeah, <laughs> which they uh, long overdue. 
I'll have to wait, take a wait and see on that one and see what they actually deliver. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm assuming they would just go with Intel uh, whenever that comes out, right. uh, should it come out. But but maybe, maybe they would have an AMD, need for AMD in that. If they really do end up committing to the pro line again. Right. I think the complaint that I heard from a lot of Mac users was that, was that the recent MacBook Pro wasn't really a pro. Uh, no, it wasn't. No, it's not. I and I know it got dinged by Laptop Mag for for ports, uh, and I understand that. I, my my problem is not with the ports. I mean, I have plenty of Android devices that have USB C, and and I can't wait for the day when everything is USB C. I think that will make my life easier. But but that's not my problem with the Mac MacBook Pro. My problem with the MacBook Pro is that it's not that much more powerful than my three year old MacBook Pro. Uh, and and when my wife is saying she might want to replace her old Mac Pro. 2010 edition with a laptop i'm telling her well you probably want to get a windows laptop then there was a funny tweet i can't remember who it was it sent, sent it to me but uh the editor of mac world was playing around with a surface the surface desktop uh-huh and <laughs> was really liking it so, you know uh, yeah Microsoft's doing a lot of things to sort of attract apple users well, and this is a minor thing, but I don't like the keyboard on the MacBook Pro either. Every right. time I go back to using my Surface Book, I'm like, ah, oh, thank God, a keyboard I can feel and use. Yeah. And, and Surface Book keyboard isn't even the best one. No. Yeah, now i got to buy a replacement trackpad for my lap, for my MacBook. Oh, so that ended up being the, the issue? It's still doing it, but it's. Yeah. I now know why it's doing it, because it's... I don't Is even the work around just though. to turn it off and use your mouse for for them. Well, I I have my laptop in a desktop configuration with the lid closed and everything plugged in. You should tell computer. Lloyd what it was doing to you because it's such a weird problem. Yeah, it literally was making the mouse just jump, but not like all over the place. It was just like on the same horizontal line. He thought he was hacked. Just, I thought I was like, <laughs> "Whoa, this is getting kind of weird." But it's just literally a flaky uh, trackpad. Like if you touch it and try to do anything with it, it's just like. Wow. It's 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 either shorting or some of the sensors in it went. I don't know. I was thinking about getting like a brand new replacement part, but they want eighty bucks. How old is it? It's a twenty twelve. It was the last uh, thirteen inch twenty twelve model they made, so it's like two point. And this is the thing; it's fast enough for everything I do with the show, right. and for ninety percent of the work. For everything else, I have like a forty seven ninety k Intel PC next to it. So, and it's, I, I actually really like it because I still, I believe it or not, I still have a couple of things that require Firewire. So I love having the <laughs> Firewire port on it. And it was weird because I knew, I knew more than a handful of uh, uh, people that had like either podcasting or some audio setup that required it because all their audio interfaces were Firewire. And then one is like, eh, I don't want to buy an adapter. I don't want to do this. I'll just buy it. Just take this notebook. Oh, let's bring Barkley up. Hi, Barkley. Oh. Say- <laughs> not a dot, she's not. Hey, look at Barkley looks looks cool. Yes, he's a uh, mostly dachshund with some beagle, I think. Because he, can uh, yeah, I can see the beagle in his kind of his ears. Yeah, but uh, yes, he, he's a rescue pup. I don't know if oh. you can see Ray. Ray's here, my new dog. We just got her a few weeks ago. I don't know if my camera will actually show her and and she won't want me to pick her up <laughs> oh sweetheart no nah, she's she's fine i don't need to be picked up she's down there i'm fine i'm fine yeah so um now i know what the ideal setting for my headset is which has been very useful actually yeah, I was there was... too much yeah so generally you want to avoid do you generally you want to avoid gain or boost if possible, um, just because it'll it'll distort any of your higher higher range frequencies. All right, well we are published. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Have a good weekend. Take care. We'll see y'all later. I know. <laughs>